Okay. There we go. Um, I am going to stick to notes here in front of me because we've got kind of tight schedule and I can drift a bit occasionally. Um, so, yeah, welcome to our webinar hosted by DG Unlimited and just um, rem remembering that this is will be on our website and some people might know not know about is that we're a, a grassroots organisation in a Scottish charity. Um, we have support from DNG Council um, via service level agreement. Um, our strategic aim as an organisation is to make Dumfries and Galloway the destination place where all artists and arts organisations want to live, work and make a living. We're currently working on a review of our strategic plan for the next four or five years. So um, we do welcome input from our members and from anyone else who's either a practitioner or involved in um, the creative sector in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, all mics will be muted during the speaker presentation and that's just to reduce interference but um, if you don't have notes and, and you want to kind of leave any questions please put it in, in the comments, uh, the chat rather and we can come to that um, later on when we're you know having the Q&A with Matt and our discussions. Um, Tabby, our creative producer will facilitate the discussions and there will be breakout rooms after that and and Tabby will give more details about that and um, she's just now going to introduce you to Matt Kitson our guest speaker who we're delighted to have with us today. Welcome everybody I'm also going to just keep an eye on the waiting room because there are a couple of I think there's three more registrants and I just want to make sure that I can let them in and case they come along a little bit late but welcome it's lovely to see you all here. Matt Kitson is our fabulous director of an organization called Driftwood Cinema. Uh, Driftwood Cinema is a film exhibition organization supporting small community cinemas to show films in small settings so I will let Matt describe it to you but in addition to that Matt is somebody who has um, gained a lot of experience um, over many years putting on community events whether that's film exhibition or community events in and around Wigtonshire dealing and working with varying numbers of volunteers, young people and people of all ages. So he's the perfect choice as far as DJ Unlimited was concerned to not only share some of his perspectives, but do's and don'ts and tips. Now, the plan for today is very simple. What we thought we would do is have a session where we can all learn from Matt, we can learn from each other, it's being recorded and by the end of this whole session, what we hope is that we'll have a brief to-do list that we can then share with the other members of DG Unlimited. And that's because all our events, what we try and do is put them on in response to requests from members. So without any further waste of time, I am delighted to welcome and introduce you to our friend, Matt Kitson. Matt, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Tabby, and Maggie as well. And hello to everyone. Claire's already run off. <laughs> <laughs> it's your magnetism that's what it yeah, is i think it was the hawaiian shirt photo was probably the issue but um i knew yes, you wouldn't i, 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 knew, you wouldn't I, you, I knew you wouldn't be happy with me too <laughs> okay i'm gonna mute myself and let you uh crack on that thank you thank you very much um as tabby excellently introduced me i'm matt kitson and um set up Driftwood Cinema back in 2014 to, with the aim of taking the cinema experience out to, to rural and underserved communities. So principally we support around 24 um, volunteer groups across Dumfries and Galloway and South Ayrshire um, who screen films monthly um, or twice monthly in village halls, community venues, etc. Um, we've, we've 
branched out from that. So we're a, we're a social enterprise, so we're not a profit organization, but we trade commercially. So we also run pop-up cinema events, outdoor cinema screenings, uh, one-off screenings for schools, community groups, um, youth groups, private um, charity events as well. We've done a few back garden charity events as well for film screenings. Um, and also I was on the Wigtown Community Council for six years um, as secretary, convener, various other roles and hats. Um, and as part of that was responsible for three years for running Wigtown Festival Week. Um, I also have done various events around um, school fates. Uh, we've started the Wigtown Shindy, which is an annual event uh, that takes place in the town gardens. Um, and also through the cinema, I'll get to see quite a lot of other community events where they engage us to, to screen films at the end of the evening, um, or we do quiz nights or karaoke's and various other bits and pieces. So um, a fair range of community events. Um, Tabby said, hopefully by the end of this, we'll have some hints and tips and bits and pieces on do's and don'ts. Um, I've probably got more don'ts than I've got do's um, over years worth of experiences, um, but hopefully we'll get some do's as we go through as well. Um, I'm going to cover kind of four topics and what I'll do is I'll just endeavour, if I can, to share my screen um, for a presentation. Uh, and hopefully this will pop up and everyone can see something along the lines of putting on a successful community event. Uh, every, give me nods, thumbs, anything else you want to stick up is quite happy. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, as Maggie says, I've got some notes, so I'm going to be working through some notes as well, just to make sure um, I'm getting on a bit, that my memory covers all the bits that I wanted to cover. Um, and then, as Tabby says, we'll have a, a chat at the end of it, and then hopefully I can get some feedback from you as well, because I'm always looking to try and improve the events that, that we run uh, and support or go along to as well. So um, we'll pop through. Uh, I've got to work out how I control this without controlling that. There we go. Excellent. It's going to be a swapping backwards and forwards between notes and what's on screen, but there we go. So we're going to cover four things in the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, the PowerPoint presentation, quite happy to share afterwards. Tabby's got a, a copy of it. Um, and it's also got the notes underneath. So uh, it will cover through sort of the notes that I'm going as we get through. So we're going to look at audience. Always start with audience. Um, you've got to know who you're delivering the event for before you can determine anything else, in, in my opinion. So we'll have a look at that. Uh, fundraising stroke ticketing. I mean, ticketing is another way of, of getting the funds in for it. So again, money is always important. Um, where you're going to get it from, how you're going to do it. Uh, then we'll have a look at volunteers, the lifeblood of community events. Um, if you actually had to pay people for what they do, you'd, you'd be chasing money forever, basically. And then we're going to have a, a quick look at marketing and advertising and um, how that kind of differs depending on your audience um, and also the type of community that, that you're in. So those are the four areas we're going to whiz through as we go. Um, so we'll start with... Uh, your audience um, and I've popped there in the center who because that as I say to me is is the key question um, and then around it are some questions you need to ask yourself in order to establish the who um, and it's basically looking at why people will want to come to your event or who you want to come to your event so it's establishing uh, your your market if you like um, so it's often kind of a circular discussion, and that's why I put the arrows going round. So you'll go from the when, the what, the where, the why, the who, the when, the what. And each time you start to answer questions, it might have a knock-on effect to one of the other questions uh, as you go round. Um, and each answering each of those four questions, why, when, what, and where, will also lead to the, the who you're trying to target for it. You can start almost anywhere in the circle, but I'm going to start on, on the why. Um, that's the question I've asked myself many times when organising an event. Why on earth am I doing this? Um, 
but that it's a valid question why are you putting on the event so you know is it like the the platinum jubilee that's coming up that it's related to a specific event that's in the calendar um is it linked to another event so is it part of a a, a bigger community or region-wide event that's going on um, is it something that traditionally happens at this time of the year or as an annual event um, and it's been going for years and you're now taking it on um, or it's just that you've had a good idea with some other people and you think it would be something that your community would want um, so by starting out with the, the why that will start to consider the event that you're about to put on and who you're going to, to target for that event. So the next question you have to ask yourself is when, when is this event going to take place? Because again, that will determine uh, who's available to come to it. And the when is also um, what time of day. So it's not just the, the calendar date, uh, whether it's a weekday, a weekend, whether it's school holidays, uh, whether it's a daytime event, whether it's an evening event, whether it's a Sunday event, um, all of those things would, would determine who is eventually going to come to to the event that you're putting on. Um, so about, I mean, Queen's Platinum Jubilee is, is forefront at the moment. So that is constrained to the four days of the Platinum Jubilee weekend. But you've got flexibility within that, whether it's a Thursday or a Saturday or a Sunday, um, whether it's an annual event, that's, that's set in the calendar, like uh, Riding of the Marches events generally are, are set in stone across the region, um, whether it's a seasonal event. So your when might be determined by, for in my case, outdoor cinema screenings, the when is determined by daylight. Um, so there's no point me putting on outdoor screenings in June and July because the films won't start until 11 p.m. because it's not dark enough. Um, and equally, it's no point putting them on in January or February because it's way too cold to sit out for more than sort of 10 minutes. Um, so that there are constraints in terms of, of when I can actually run those events. Um, is the event, can the event or is it going to run indoors or is it going to be outdoors? So if it's outdoors, you're probably looking at nicer weather times. Uh, if it's indoors, you're more free in terms of, of when you can hold the event. And are you attracting, you know, young people, in which case you need to consider school holidays. Um, there is the tradition, the first two weeks of the summer school holidays, um, everyone with school children is off on holiday somewhere else, uh, obviously not the last couple of years. Um, but traditionally, uh, we tend to disappear off the first two weeks to beat the English school holidays away. Um, so again, if, you, if you're looking at uh, school children in particular, you might be looking at the, the back end of the school holiday. So we then move on to the what. Um, and this is obviously what event and what type of event are you actually putting on and what's the central focus of the event? So is it uh, a music related event? So is the central focus music uh, with local bands or performances um, or a karaoke or something similar? Is it is it a performance play? Um, is it a pageant style event that you're putting on? Is it a fate style of event with lots of other things going on around it? Um, so your next question determining who's going to come to it is what type of event it is. Okay. Uh, and the final question in this way of doing it round is the where. Um, so where is the event taking place? I've touched on this in terms of indoors and out. Um, but is it in the town gardens? Is it going to be a street party? Therefore, you've got road closures to look at. Um, what level of access is required to the venue? So you've decided what you're going to put on, but can people actually access the, the venue? Is the venue big enough for the, for the numbers of people that you want? Um, and you also start to look at the opportunities and limitations of proposed venues. So accessibility, um, ingress and egress of your audience, parking, uh, people getting there by public transport or walking to the event, safety at the event, uh, and licensing um, will start to come. And obviously, the big one, cost. Um, how much does it actually cost to, to hire the venue out or use the venue and permissions to use it? Um, so with all of those, if you start to answer all of those questions, that will start to lead you towards who is likely and able to attend your event and who you're going to be able to attract to it. Um, 
And as I say, you might actually start with the flip side because you might have support funding or the idea might be targeted at a specific who. Um, for example, we were looking at doing film screenings that were targeted at people with dementia and uh, the, the carers of people with dementia. So that was our who. So we then had to go to the outside of the, the question ring and start doing the why, where, what, etc. Okay, so you may have a specific audience and you work your way out from that one. Okay, um, so we will move on having established, hopefully, um, your audience. Let's have a look a bit at uh, fundraising. So you've got your why, what, when, where, who, um, but you need to pay for it somehow. Um, unfortunately, the very few free, totally free tickets, um, everything's got to pay for from licensing uh, onwards, uh, fees for acts that might be performing, uh, film licensing, Dumfries and Galloway licensing requirements, etc. So costs are associated with it. Um, so we're going to have a look at several areas of fundraising and ticketing is in there. Um, so it's kind of looking at fundraising for the event in terms of uh, preloading or event loading and event loading is primarily raising money at the event itself ticketing and a lot of the other options here are getting money up front to cover your costs so and it might be that you choose to run a, a, a mixture of both and you've been to events and have experience of events that have used many of these anyway but um quite often that the the first port of call for community events is grant funding um, there have been quite a few grant opportunities with Dumfries and Galloway Council recently in terms of community events and funds available for um, bringing the community together and post-COVID. Um, those seem to be winding up at the moment, um, but there are still a lot of uh, grant fund organisations, obviously the um, National Lottery being one of the big ones um, that are available and will part or fully fund uh, community events or pilots for community events. So it's the first time you've run it, um, then you can be funding for, for running it as a pilot in order to, to be able to run it in future years. Um, one that's that's less often used, um, but used more in the bigger, like the agricultural events, et cetera, um, is, is sponsorship. Um, and we tend to think of sponsorship as, as large corporate sponsors. Um, but on community events, you can lots of 25, 50, 85, 100 pounds um, from local businesses to support the events um, can soon add up. Um, we did that with the Shindy last year and got nearly 2000 pounds from local businesses who, who sponsored certain aspects of it, including the marquee and the stage and the bar. There seem to be a lot of people who are quite happy to sponsor the bar. Um, so always quite a good one. And that sponsorship can also be in the form of uh, in kind. So we'll talk about sort of in event fundraising, but raffles, etc., uh, can be prizes for raffles can, can be involved. You need to be obviously with sponsors looking at uh, the who of the event. So who's going to be attending uh, and looking at what, whether they are a target customer for the, for the businesses that you're approaching um and 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 sell it to them in terms of you will reach x number of people at this event for supporting it um traditionally you would have you'd look at a main sponsor and then satellite sponsors so a main event sponsor have a look around um at other organizations in terms of your pricing structure for sponsors um if they're local small community events and you're looking at local shops and businesses um, then between 25 to 100 pounds per sponsor is, is a reasonable amount. Um, and that's for events that would attack sort of two to 300 people locally um, and then up from there. But uh, you can do that by sounding out local businesses and just saying, would you be interested? How much would you be interested in sponsoring for? Um, if you do go for sponsorship and we'll touch on advertising as well, make sure you're giving feedback, make sure you have some way of um, after the event feeding back to the sponsors and the advertisers about how much their message got across to people 
Okay, so we're, we're, we're not touching on um, post event evaluation, but you need to consider that because if you want them to come back next year, you need to be able to give them some evidence of, of what they've achieved. Um, advertising, uh, similar. Um, you can be wider with your, with your advertising. Um, look at where the adverts can be placed, um, not only at the event itself, um, but in any promotions that you do at the event beforehand, any posters uh, on the tickets themselves, if you're doing a ticketed event, uh, on your social media posts. So if you're, if you're allowing advertising, what are they getting for the money? So is it a banner just on the railings around the event or is it a banner plus a mention in the program plus mentions on social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and try to go with a package rather than say, are you interested in advertising? Go with a, here are our advertising packages if you want to sign up for it. Okay. Touched on in kind. So again, not all businesses, particularly at the moment, can give money or are happy to give money, um, but they can contribute some other um, items. So it could be a raffle prize. It could be to sponsor an award. If like at the Shindy, we, we do a, a volunteer of the year award and various other bits and pieces that are handed out. So we get people to um, either purchase the the award which lasts then several years or they'll contribute a gift that goes with the award um, as they go through um, the other thing to consider is pre-event fundraising so i'm going to jump over ticket sales for a moment because this is this pre-event um, we do this a lot with community events here is we actually have other smaller events that raise funds towards the main event so we have um, local things that, that are placed in the shops, uh, a Lucky Squares competition. For the cinema, we have um, 50 films where you just put your name in a box against one of the films um, and then scratch off at the top and the winner gets 50% of whatever the, the card value is. Um, we, we do quiz nights. So again, we, we get funds from the quiz nights and all of those then feed into the funds for, for running the main event. Um, so little mini events, what they also help with and we'll touch on marketing and advertising is having mini events as fundraisers also raise awareness of the main event that is coming along at the end of the day. Um, cancer research obviously do the walk for life every year. Um, and part of that is obviously getting people in the teams to raise money leading up to the main event as well as raising money on the day. And that's almost a, a year's lead into the main event. And all of that is getting into people's heads about the big event that's coming up um, down the line. And the last one on the list there is ticket sales. So actually at the event itself uh, leading up to it is selling tickets. Um, and you need to look at whether that's front or back loaded. So are you selling in advance um, of the event or are you selling only on the door? Um, obviously you might be doing a free event in which case no tickets but even with a free event you might insist that people get tickets so that you can gauge numbers that are going to be there on the day um, if you are front loading are you going to have discounts for early purchase so to encourage people to to engage early so the music festival tiered approach um, if you buy it 10 weeks before the event, you get 50% off. If you get it five weeks before the event, you get 25% off the, the on-door price. Are you going to have um, family tickets? Uh, are you going to have concessions? Um, so do you have a, an adult price and then a concession price? Um, or what we're doing with, with some of our film screenings now is a, a pay what you can afford. Uh, approach particularly for community events is is good if you have to have ticket sales it, it's a good approach um, and you you we've got some pre-worded um, uh, options available that suggest based on disposable income a recommended amount to, to pay for a ticket but no requirement to, to meet a specific one um, the advantage obviously is is pre-purchase tickets is a you get the feel of how many people are coming um, it gives a commitment for people to come if they bought a ticket um, and it gets you revenue in there to deal with your cash flow as you lead up to the actual event and have to start paying suppliers, etc. as you go through. 
So that is a whirlwind fundraising <laughs> and ticketing. Um, so we'll move on to the, the lifeblood of community events, um, and that is volunteers. Um, there's a lot of notes I've got it here under, under volunteers, um, and it's quite a difficult area to look at because if you are organizing events, effectively your volunteers are employees of yours. Um, so we don't cover in terms of uh, insurance and liability, but if you do have volunteers, you are liable for them. Um, so just uh, at some point in the future, if you haven't already done so, look up public liability and employer li li liability. I can say liability, that would be a liability, but there we go. Um, key things to look at are motivation with, with volunteers. Um, why? Why? Why do people, why do you volunteer? Why does anyone volunteer for anything? Um, and that can be a myriad of reasons why people will, will step up and support your event. Um, you have serial volunteers, people who just like volunteering. Um, that's what they do. Um, people might be particularly engaged with what you're trying to do with the event. So that, you know, they're really keen to, to support it and get it going. You've got people who are use it to, to fill their spare time. They have spare time and they like to, to get involved with groups. You have people who um, like to be seen, like to be out there uh, with the high vis vest on and like to be seen supporting groups as they go through. So part of, of when you're looking at getting volunteers, is you need to look at why people might want to support your event. So we're back to questions. Why, why is it? Is it children? Is it, as I say, dementia and Alzheimer's that, that people might be engaged in? And you need to promote being a volunteer based on, on those, those styles. Um, preparation, we touched on legal responsibilities. So you have employer liability. Um, depending on the type of event that you've got and what you're asking volunteers to do, you will have responsibilities um, regarding licensing. So are you selling alcohol? Uh, in which case they have to be trained. They obviously have to be over uh, 18 to sell alcohol. Um, are you selling food? Um, in which case health and hygiene needs to be covered when you're, you're looking at volunteers. Um, You'll be dealing probably, well, you have the front of stage and behind stage, the backstage um, roles as well. So the volunteers that are there, are they comfortable with dealing with the public? Uh, are they comfortable with the visibility or are they more a uh, behind the scenes um, approach? So you need to look at the roles that you've got. So clearly look at the role descriptions and what is involved in what you're asking the volunteers to do um, so that they can look to see whether they feel they're best suited to, to the roles that are on offer or even if there is a role available for them to do it. Uh, you need to draft up your induction because again talked about the, the legal responsibilities but you need to with volunteers have induction sec sessions before you start. Um, to make sure that they know what their role is, what's expected of them, um, but also where they can seek help and advice if things aren't going well, so that they're being supported. Um, and a part of that induction is how you will engage with them or your board or management team will engage with them throughout the event. So they're not just stuck on a gate and left there for 10 hours. Um, you know, that people will be popping around uh, and checking how they're going as they go through. Um, and that's about keeping your volunteers happy. Um, quite often, I've seen a few events where people are stuck out doing roles, particularly out on the periphery, um, and they're just left there and nobody gets in touch with them. Nobody makes them a cup of tea. Nobody sorts them out for toilet breaks. Nobody brings them food. Um, you know, and it's a rainy day, nobody's put any cover for them, but they're expected to, to stand out in the rain for, for 10 hours. Um, so you need to make sure that they're supported throughout the day and they, they know where to go to if, if they've got a difficult situation. Um, the thing I'll say with volunteers, it's a bit like front of house staff, volunteers will make or break your event. Um, they're the people, they're the ones people go to if they've got a problem um, or if they're upset. Um, they're also the people who, you know, if they're having a good time as volunteers, can help the people who are coming to the event have a good time as well. 
Okay. Um, you need to look at the individual skills of um, the volunteers you've got. Um, so it's it's round peg square holes. Um, some people would do volunteer because they want to try to do something new. So take that into account. But largely it's, uh, well, what are they actually good at? What are they comfortable doing? And what skills they've got? So whilst talking about sort of volunteers on the actual day, you also have volunteers that will help you develop the event um, from day one. Um, we're going to talk about marketing and advertising. Have you got volunteers who have a background in marketing and advertising? Uh, have you got design people with background in design that can do graphics for you? Have you got people who are with project management experience? Um, so when, when you're looking at the volunteers, make use of the skills that they've got. Um, and But bear in mind that sometimes people want to do volunteering because they want to step away entirely from what they do in their day-to-day -day job. Um, I've known a number of organisations that have volunteers on their board um, and they see that they're accountants uh, and they just say, all right, well, you can do all the finance stuff. And it's like, but I do that 50 hours a week. What I actually want to do is, you know, deal with the karaoke machine or I want to, you know, do the pony rides or I want to deal with the bouncy castle. I want to switch off from what I do. So um, bear that in mind. Other people will, will be looking at it as a learning opportunity. They want to develop their own skills um, as they go through. So, you know, if you can support them to do that, then you're likely to retain um, the volunteers going forward for future events and they're going to feed back to other people that they had a good experience volunteering um, so things that that are likely to lose you your volunteer um, is if things change uh, without prior notification and they're left to deal with it at the front line um, so make keeping them up to date with what's going on if you take them for granted so you just assume that they're going to turn up and they know what they're going to do. You ask them to do too much. Um, so you're taking too much of their time um, or they don't feel equipped for the role that you've given them. So, OK, so they're completely out, out of their depth. There's some more in there. I'm not going to go through all of them. And I've also listed a few that will help make them stay. So to twist it to the positive side of things. Um, so you can have a read through the notes as you go as it, when you get the, the presentation through. Um, touched a little bit on skills. You need a range of skills. So when looking for volunteers, try and encourage people with different range of skills. When you're asking for volunteers, ask for the type of skills that you, you want um, or that people can apply for to go through. Because again, if they know from, from day one what they're aiming for, uh, what's available and what's expected of them, people are likely more likely to, to step forward. Where are your volunteers coming from? Um, you may be, I'm fortunate here that we have the Wigtown Festival every year and they have a massive list of people who volunteer for the festival. Um, and they are quite happy to put out opportunities to their pool of volunteers. Um, if not, then look at some of the existing voluntary organisations and groups that operate in your area. So U3A um, groups, if you've got any weavers groups, if you've got any art groups, music groups, other social groups that are around, um, if you're a frequenter of the pub, I quite often get a few from the from the pub, um, and I remind them when they've sobered up that they did volunteer. So that's uh, that's quite good. But uh, get it in writing after a couple of drinks, I would say. Um, and the last bit I would say is feedback. Um, quite often forgotten. So at the end of the event, um, either have a wash up event with the with the volunteers, get their feedback on how the event went. Uh, from their perspective, what went well, what could be improved. Um, and then you've got something to take forward if you're, if you're running the event again in the future that you can develop on. So don't just finish the event, bring them back together, almost reward as well. You know, if it's tea and cake and a chat about how the event went, um, but get the feedback from them as well as looking at feedback from your audience. Um, because you'll learn a lot from your volunteers at the event as well. Right, well, we're moving on to my last slide, hopefully. Oh, no. Oh. Ah, phew. Proper preparation, always good. Right, um, marketing. I mean, it, it's, uh, as 
big a topic as you want, basically, um, advertising and marketing. Um, back to the very first slide, the who. Um, the who will determine your marketing and, and how you're going to reach them. Um, so you need to find out what motivates your target audience. So what gets them out of bed and gets them to go to things rather than um, saying, oh, that's not for me. Um, once you've got your wider audience, try and segment your audience down. So if you've got a community garden party or fete or something similar that is attracting basically almost everybody in the community you want to come along, they're not all going to respond to the same types of marketing uh, material. And this is kind of in, in two ways. One is um, what where they hang out. So where do they get their information from, but also what motivates them. So you, you would look to create a marketing strategy that would look at um, teenagers. So if it's for all events, you're going to have a different marketing strategy for teenagers, to working parents, to young single adults, um, to middle-aged uh, empty nest parents, to uh, the older generation. So one marketing message is not going to fit all of those groups and one uh, marketing method is not going to fit all of those groups. So segment your audience and then plan how you're going to advertise and market to each of those groups and on what platforms or methods are you going to, to, to actually do that. Um, and part of this is it's a bit from sort of product sales side of things is you need to know your event. So who is your event aimed at? And what are the key selling points within your event that will get people? So if it's a music event, who's the headline act? Um, have you got local groups that are on ahead of the, the main group, in which case you can target and advertise that you've got a local group coming up that will bring in family, friends, uh, and, and neighbors, et cetera, to come along. Um, it's, if it's a fate, what kind of activities are you going to have at the fate that would attract different types of audiences? So is it game shows? Is it quizzes? Is it tr traditional fate stuff like whack-a-mole and, you know, pin a tail on the donkey and duck and stool and things? Are you having competitions at the event, such as tug of war, et cetera, that can, people can take part in? So if you don't know your event, how are you going to sell it to anybody else? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you're when you're doing your advertising, um, you need to look at your countdown. So when are you going to start advertising it, uh, and how are you going to advertise it through that window? Um, and largely, what you want to do with marketing and advertising is get other people to do the advertising for you. So you want to be. Um, kind of the person who unties the tanker and starts the engine and just pushes it offshore but then it just keeps going and going and going and going and spreading out from there so your initial marketing um how far in advance so again knowing who goes to it uh, or who you're hoping will go to it what kind of pattern of behavior do they have for going to events so are they uh we don't commit to anything until the last minute are we we like to book weeks in advance and know that it's in our calendar um and that's how you can kind of plan your countdown to it uh, and at the start of the countdown it's more about the the facts and information about the event alongside teasers so things that give a bit of information but want pe people want more. They want to find out and they want to engage about it. So questions, little hints, little tips up front alongside factual information about the dates and times just to get it set in people's minds. Things that start conversations as people go through. Um, some people do... Um, free tickets, some people do uh, um, advanced prizes, etc. as they go through to engage with people. Some people just ask questions. So what do you think about having this? What do you think about doing this? What's your favorite? 
rank these one to three. Have you ever done this? You know, so bucket lists kind of things, things that get people talking. Um, you mentioned about ticket pricing. Are you going to have tiered ticket pricing? So 10 weeks out, you're going to have a, a, a ticket price. Five weeks out, you're going to have a ticket price on the day ticket price. If so, you need to sell the benefits of, of buying early and what that gets you. It might not be a discounted ticket price. It might be that it gives you access to, to things that are in the event that they would have to pay for or are limited accessibility. Okay. Um, are you doing individual tickets, group tickets, um, upgrade offers? Is there a VIP area that you can offer within uh, the event that you're taking place? Um, various bits and pieces of, of selling tickets up front. Are you going to have agents that are going to sell tickets for you? Um, and how are you going to sell tickets? Are they online? Are they physically in local shops that people can go and buy? Um, and how do you manage if you've got limited number of tickets to cross over between the two? Once you've kind of got the message you want to get out, um, you've then got to get how you're going to get it out there. Um, I don't know if you, people may or may not have come across a chap called Kenny Barr, who works at the festival, used to work at the festival company here uh, in Wigtown. And he always had a saying that I could walk out into the high street and slap somebody around the face with a wet fish five or six times. Uh, and the following day, I'd meet them in the street and they would deny ever seeing the fish in the first place. Um, and that's what the marketing manager is up against, basically is getting not only the message in their face in the first place, but getting it into their head as well. Um, quite often we tend to, to levitate towards social media as our main marketing platform. Um, but again, depending on who you're aiming at, they may not be people who are on social media. Um, they equally may only be on some of the social media platforms. So if you're on Facebook, unfortunately nowadays, you're largely uh, aiming at somebody like me. Um, whereas you're not aiming at my children, you know, because they wouldn't be seen dead on there. But even Twitter not, is no longer there. So uh, you're looking at TikTok and other methods. Again, come back to your volunteers. If that's your market audience, have you got somebody that, you know, has skills in those social media aspects? Um, particularly think about young volunteers uh, and developing them doing social media. Um, paper again is still there so posters in local venues uh shops etc flyers that are available um leaflets that people can take away if it's uh, a smaller community can you do a door-to-door -door drop um because again people will say i've never seen the poster i've never seen the flyer but if you stuffed it through the letterbox um they've had to actually at least pick it up and put it in the bin um if it's a bigger event, you're looking at newspapers and uh, magazines, local radio. Tabby has a radio show on a Friday. Always good to get the message out there. Um, but with all the advertising, look what's looks look for the unique thing. What makes your event different to everything else that's out there? Uh, everything that's available, um, and also. Um, one of the other things we do quite often with with the stuff that we put out is we put something out that we can track with their interacting with it. Um, so we did one that if you took the little coupon at the bottom of the flyer, um, the co-op who was one of our sponsors would give you uh, a, a free Kit Kat. Um, so we, we, we got feedback on terms of who was looking at the stuff that we're putting out there. Um, so the, there are various bits and pieces that, that you can do, but the, the, couple of final points is is using other events so see what works elsewhere um you can look on social media and you can see who's again engaging with events and how they're engaging and what types of things they're engaging with um and you can get uh information from social media in terms of uh groups that are interacting to to target um, but have a look back at other events or similar events. And if you can get information or you can talk to the community, uh, people or organize it, find out um, what marketing methods worked and how people um, interacted with those. And then the last bit, I say, is mix promotion with conversation. 
if everything you're pushing out is that it's being pushed out it's just saying here's the event here's the event come along to our event this is the event it's on this day this is what's going if it's all information that's pushed um people switch off after a while so what you need to develop is a mix of promotion and conversation and in marketing they work on a four to one rule and it is one bit of direct promotion facts about the information four bits that are conversation that are what do you think about what would you do have you done this you know have you seen this group have you done that do you remember playing whack-a-mole back in the day have you ever been on a ducking stool you know have you ever done tug of war so start a conversation around you know what are the rules of tug of war that'll start a conversation because you know once you have a tug of war everybody has different rules <laughs> okay oh too far and i think i probably went over time but i do like to chat no it was really good and you didn't really go over time at all you didn't <laughs> um thank you matt that was really interesting folks if you want to turn your videos and mics back on uh, we can start our q and I i don't know about all of you but i've got questions <laughs> i've got questions so um let's make this because we're quite a small group so we can make it more of a chat rather than like when we're when we when we've done this and there's been nearly 20 of us we've had to do everything on the chat and keep it all under control but i think we can we can actually just have a nice conversation with Matt. So um, I'm going to start things off, if that's okay. I've got lots, I, I was doodling away and making notes and everything, but I think I'll start with, I'm sorry if this is not in the order in which you were doing your excellent presentation, but I wanted to start with this because it's really something that we've struggled with as an organization with my other hat, my media factory hat. And that's, we find it easier to get people to help us with our events when we're paying them something. That's the truth of it. It's the absolute bottom line. Um, if we offer young people a mentorship or a small commission, we're inundated. But if we ask for people to do things for free, tumbleweed. For exactly the same activity so i wondered how you've tackled that in the past and what your exp if your experience is similar and i value i i see the value in volunteering and 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 having and giving a volunteering experience to people but i think there's a balance and i think especially just now if there's a way that we can give them some token thing or cover their expenses that no, that makes it not strictly volunteering. What do you think um, of that, Matt? Yeah, I mean, some of the screening events and some of the, the uh, race nights and quiz nights, we pay people to come in and do some of the roles. So um, on the race night, we offer a, that it's a meal, so you get fish and chip supper. Um, and, yeah, we pay young people to come along and pick up the food, deliver the food, clear it away, the plates away afterwards and do washing up. Um, and we, we pay them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a huge amount. Um, I think they get about between 20 or 30 pounds for the night. Um, so not, not a massive amount. Um, we also pay somebody to run the bar because um, it, it's quite a responsible role in terms of, of something for someone to do uh, and speed of service. If we've got somebody who's, who's used to running a VAR, it's speed of service. Um, so we're, we're paying for that to go through. But we will then have volunteers who will do um, taking tickets, showing people to their seats um, and uh, running backwards and forwards with kind of bets and various other bits and pieces and uh, table service for, for drinks. So we do a, a mix on some events of paid and free volunteers, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I know with the, the festival company, they, they get um, a free top and a cap, which has Wigtown Festival on it, um, which they get to keep. So 
another way of attracting people is by giving them merchandise that is related to the event that's taking place so they get a something to take away with them that's unique that they can carry around um which i think with the commonwealth games and the olympics they did as well so it's expenses plus you got your full outfit that you got to walk around and uh, strut the tube and the train to show everybody you were a volunteer at the games yeah. um you can also in terms of fundraising if you're looking for grant funding um if you're including an internship that is development for uh, a group that the funder is looking to support then that can boost your grant application so particularly as you say internships so if you you took somebody on um over three or four months to do the event management or program management or booking of acts or something and you could show that you were taking somebody and developing their skills um, then there's the opportunity in the the in your round of funding for grants to apply for money to cover that cost as well um, and that could could be then a, a recurring thing so if it is an annual event you can look at that as a recurring thing it's also something you can look at with sponsors as well um, when you're looking to what's in it for the sponsor um, if they're seen as supporting developing somebody or skills training somebody then they may well be happy to put in sponsorship to for a specific role to support that okay um just while you were talking i think it's probably also worth sharing one of the things that we got some volunteer support from was from the local ncvo they they've got a list of regular volunteers mm. so if you're short of volunteers they can they they've got a database of people who just are always looking for volunteering opportunities and sometimes we have found volunteers from people amongst people who are um how can i put it who are wanting to build up their cvs and their experience so that they can get work claire claire had a question yeah just a couple of things thinking of there and um for those that i haven't met I, uh, i'm at the Hollywood Trust. So my questions related to young people, my comments related to young people, you'll wonder, you'll understand why I'm focused there. I suppose it was two things really. I think we maybe have to be mindful. And I realized when you were saying Tabby in that introduction of how difficult it can be to get volunteers. And for young people, when you do internships, you can get lots of people, but when you're not paying them, you can't. I think we have to remember that um, we don't want to create a culture that volunteering is for those that can afford to give their time for free and I think particularly when we look at young people you know we have a, a lot of young people that they don't have the support the financial backing so whilst they might love to get involved with projects they maybe they can't take time away from from the jobs and the things that they need to earn their money. I also think as well, there's something at the moment of the building confidence. So I really liked uh, you went into a lot of depth in volunteers, um, Matt, which I can tell that the years of experience, um, there's many things that's like, oh, I bet I could ask Matt, and he'll have X stories around that <laughs> particular thing that's popped into his head there. And I think it's making sure that there's enough support and training. Um, so I think whilst it's that hooking in and the enthusiasm why someone might want to get involved with your event but I think it's being well supported to feel that like you said that you're not putting them somewhere where they're not going to feel comfortable and maybe for different types of volunteers there might be different levels of what you maybe need to consider doing I think also for our young people coming out of COVID now on what they have all had to endure live through and cope with um, you know there are anxieties out there and again I think there's a want to do things in person and be involved but maybe for some people that that might again need a little bit more support might need a slightly different approach so that was just a couple of things that you made me think ground there thanks matt thanks claire i agree with you and actually of all the volunteers we've ever had the biggest responses have been from young people i have to say for for, for our organization anyway does anyone else have a, a question or maggie an interesting observation though about you know, coming out of, of lockdown and, and that kind of blended and just that we are finding that people are still, we get more response to the online events that we're running than we are to the in-person. So that, you know, that's obviously because I'm still a bit nervous about doing 
um, about getting out there in, in person. But um, yes, that, that's, that's a thing that I think we're all having to be mindful of, that we're still you know, and very much in a recovery. And actually, you know, there's still a lot of COVID around, so it's quite understandable that people are a bit reticent still about coming out. Um, I then would be interested in, you know, that's a huge amount of work. That comes across, you know, like putting on an event. Uh, all the areas that you discussed, you know, that thinking about it beforehand, your sponsorship, your volunteers. So maybe Maybe your views on how to balance the cost, if you like, the benefits. So the cost versus the benefit to your organisation, Matt. It's something sometimes that people don't consider um, that how, you know, they actually have to think of what time for an organisation is going to have to be input to whatever that they do and what will the returns on that be. So sometimes you know, that small time sponsorship might take a lot of your time and may not generate a lot financially or or uh, in the PR. So interesting to hear how you've managed to balance that. Yeah, and, and had some absolute howlers on some things as well, where it's an awful lot of effort and absolutely nothing's come out of it, no benefits come out of it whatsoever. Um, it's a difficult situation because you kind of have to know why you're going into it in the first place. Um, so is it, what's the purpose of the event? Are you trying um, to create a community event that is self-sustaining or whether it's a, it's a one-off event for a specific activity um, and how you approach it, I think will, will change based on that. Um, in terms of, of, planning for the event, answering the question of your audience and how big your audience is likely to be will should then inform how much effort you are prepared to put into making that event happen. Um, so if you're looking at 50 people, um, then you're looking at limited costs with that. So you, the way we tend to do it with films is a per head cost. Um, so if we've got an audience of 200 people, what is a reasonable per head cost for putting on that event? Um, for cinema events, it's, it's largely around the highest we would go is three times the ticket price. So if it's starting to come out of more than three times the ticket price, then it's not really a viable event unless it's for a specific targeted purpose and that we can justify that for a community benefit or for Driftwood Cinema as a promotional benefit to Driftwood Cinema because we're actually getting the, the brand known to people. Um, and it's similar when people approach us to book us um, in terms of our costs for, for supplying event. Um, we're pretty up, up front with how much it's going to cost and suggest to them that if you want to put an outdoor screening on, it's going to cost you at least £500. So if you're looking to run that event as a charity event, you've got our £500. You've then got, you know, all of the food, drink, raffles, venue, everything else you want to put on top of it. Are you actually going to make a return on that for the charity or not? And if it's going to be pence or not? Um, I mean, we're quite fortunate. I mean, there's two of us working and we're, we're paid um, aside from actual events, but a lot of our events are project based. So we apply for a grant and that's to run a specific project. Um, and obviously up with the grant conditions, we have to deliver the benefits that we set out to do from the outset. Um, and we have in the past gone back to a grant funder and saying, we're now looking at it and we can't do that. Um, and it's either we adjust what we set out to do in the first place um, and agree to say this is what we can deliver or it's by mutual agreement we kind of walk away from it because you know the money's better spent elsewhere <laughs> but I think yeah I mean a, a per head price is quite a, a good way to work it out um, what we also do and a lot of grant funders do this now but um, we also we've always done it is we work out how much it would cost if we had to pay for what the volunteer would do 
Um, and that's a good way to kind of work it out and say, you know, realistically, this is how much it would cost if we had to pay people to run this because we can't guarantee getting volunteers to do it. Um, I did, we, we put on, a, I'm trying to think what it was, oh, it was a quiz night. We were trying to put on a quiz night um, and we went through all the hoops, put the advertising out, booked the venue, et cetera. And a week before the event, we'd only sold two tickets. Um, and it, it was at that point we kind of sort of said, right, let's step back from it. But we went out to everybody and, and, and said, why aren't you coming, essentially? Um, and we got a lot of feedback in terms of ticket price, a lot of things you're saying about COVID. People weren't happy yet at coming out to the venue. Um, that there wasn't enough information about what would be involved. The quiz night involved using your smartphone so that people put off by technology aspects of it as well. Um, so it's, it's part of the planning. I think you also need to build in breakpoints to check whether it's still viable and achieving what you want to do. Um, you know, and part of the marketing and trying to get a two-way conversation is to try and get feedback and find out whether you are actually reaching people or not. But I would say, don't be afraid to sort of say, it's not working. We, we need to re step back. I mean, the, the COVID stuff you were saying that we have the same with the, the cinema venues, the community venues. Um, and we're having to, to put out a lot more information about how we are COVID safe. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more of the marketing message. Um, and how we deal with that. And what we're finding is that a lot more of that is word of mouth. So people who've come back and seen films have then gone out and said, oh, yeah, it was fine. They did this, 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 and this. You know, we've kind of fed that out to organisations. Uh, just those, I'd also like to kind of reinforce a thing about, you said about funders, and that's really, I've always found, go back to your funder if you're experiencing any difficulties whatsoever. They want, the, the event they want the outcomes and, and they want you to discuss any issues that you might be having and then that thing about you know when something isn't working go out and ask that's really great advice and it sounds like you've got a lot of good information back from that so thanks matt Thank clear i guess as the as the funder in the room i should probably add a comment in there shouldn't i as i'm not doing my job <laughs> um, I suppose just to echo that, Maggie, that you're absolutely right. And um, I've worked for a couple of different funders over my time. And I think the saddest thing is when the first you hear about a project that hasn't gone down the route that was planned is when it's too late. And mm -hmm. I think there is that. And obviously, all funders are very different. Hollywood Trust is very different in lots of ways as well. But it's the element that actually they might be able to help you. They can't give you more money, but actually there may be some connections that they have. There may, don't be surprised, yours won't be the first project that maybe hasn't gone straight from A to B to C and has had to take a different route. So you're not going to surprise funders in the sense of if something has been thrown up out with your circumstances often, the best thing to do is not bury your head in the sand because it actually is gonna make things far worse. So. Be brave, have that conversation um, because it will help you along the way. And I know it's hard to do, but at the trust, we like to think we're approachable. So <laughs> obviously can't speak for all funders there, but we do we do try our hardest, hopefully, to put that friendly face and please come talk to us if it's a project that we're supporting and something isn't working right for you. The sooner we know about it, then it helps to have that conversation. I, I would 100% agree with that. Thank you for, for, for saying that, Claire. I would also say tap into your networks of support. So, for example, in the creative sector, you've got all of us here at DG Unlimited. So while, while we may not be the funders, we can help you market things. You know, if you've got an event, tell us and we can put it into our network. I know the Hollywood Trust are brilliant at sharing events that are being um, put on, particularly within, you know, it's things that are, are going to attract young people. Um, Amy. Um, I, I would like to, yeah, I think I would sort of echo what Hannah was saying about the, the culture of um, volunteering. And coming from, a, coming from, I've lived in several small communities where events haven't been perhaps it's not been um, 
an event that's been organised by a professional organisation or by someone like yourself, Matt, who's, you know, got a lot of knowledge of marketing. And I think what you were saying, Matt, about looking after the volunteers really resonated with me. And not only from personal experience, but seeing events being put together by with best intentions, but actually the people organizing the event are perhaps not either equipped or able to carry the event forward and to give that support to the volunteers. There'll be a lack of communication, volunteers won't know what's expected of them. And I, I just wondered how, it just made me think about it depends on the place, it depends on the, you know, the community. Wigton's obviously got a very strong record of community events, especially with the, the, the festival. Um, and I would say a, an event there is very, very different from something that DG, uh, DG Unlimited are perhaps organizing. But how do you, I mean, you can support volunteers, but how do you offer more support for these small villages that want to put on events, but perhaps they fall flat because of lack of expertise or knowledge or people skills or doing things the way they've always been done, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, it's worth mentioning kind of what we do, we do for cinema, but what DG Arts Festival do for live performance. Um, so we very much work on a promoter's basis. So communities that want to show films, um, we do all the kind of technical stuff and the skills training and help them with marketing and advice um, so that they can concentrate on talking to people locally, getting them engaged with it, with it and pressing play and end on the DVD, basically putting the chairs out. So it's that we take, as you say, hopefully the professional bits of it that, that they don't need to learn about, um, getting their licenses, getting the films out to them, um, supplying the equipment for them to show the films, et cetera, um, giving their advice about the venue that they're using to help improve it. Um, and DG Arts do the same in terms of live performance events for venues. And we have quite a crossover with DG Arts Festival um, so that some of our venues will start out showing films. They cut the teeth on film because, um, you're not having to deal with people who only want blue smarties and a special green room and other bits and pieces for the performance. But once they're used to an audience coming in, once they're used to, to engaging with an audience, selling tickets, um, managing the venue, people coming in, going out, so they, they develop that, um, they quite often migrate and say, well, we'd like to do live performance now. Uh, and, and we kind of pass them across to, to DG Arts who then give them advice and support and, and booking acts and stuff that go with that. Now that works fine if it's live performance or if it's cinema, um, but what if it is, you know, a, a local um, fun day in the, in the park, um, who do you turn to to do that? And what I would say is we work on a network basis. So what I would do is, is as Tabby says, reach out to other people, um, find out events that have been running longer in other, communities that are similar to yours and just try and reach out to them um, to get some advice and guidance um, quite often they're, they're quite happy to chat to people about it you know because it's with a matter of pride that theirs runs really well and and you found out about it and learned about it um, you know um, third sector Dumfries as well you know will will provide good advice DG Unlimited as Tavi says another good place to to go for advice and guidance one of the things I will say with Wigtown and a lot of communities is that um, it tends to be the same bunch of people. Mm -hmm. um, so you tend to draw on the same pool of volunteers uh, and that can be a good thing um, because you've got the volunteers and once you've got them, you kind of know them. Um, but it can be a bad thing because it can stifle other people coming forward and it can stifle different ways of, of improving the event um and i think the only way that that you can encourage other people to step forward um is to to look at things that they've got the skills or might want to become involved with or have 
as open a discussion as possible. But we found that with a couple of events that that they are just Wigtown Community Week got so much in a rut for about six or seven years that it was just exactly the same events year in year out and the numbers of people attending each of those events was going down and down and down and down and down mm-hmm. um, so it needed a big revitalize um, so we have actually appro- approached um, the youth development team for the Maccas and, and ask them for some advice because they put on loads of summer events for kids and stuff like that um, and just said what can we do? Um, we also spoke to Port William, who have a very successful festival week, uh, and, and asked them what they did, how they did it, how they fundraised, uh, how they got the message out. Yeah, so. I guess what you're saying, you know, it's like not only well, knowing your audience, but it, to me, it's a, it's. I'm thinking back to when I used to volunteer with teenagers, and it's about consulting with those young people and working out exactly what what it is they want, what kind of events they want delivering rather than rather than a, a group of people or a community delivering what they think is best for the young people you know and hopefully we've moved on from that scenario but I think it does still exist hmm. in, in smaller communities. Thank you Amy. Um, okay time is marching on now are you all happy to do a short breakout group or would you rather just continue to have the discussion with all of us here together I can create a breakout group for the four of you and you can talk amongst yourselves and 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 share experiences and ideas and then come back to us or we can continue to share our thoughts and suggestions and ideas here in in the group what would you all prefer I think having... so few of us, the breakout group would be less valuable. Okay, so we'll just keep going. Everybody thumbs up on just keeping going. Cool. Okay, and if we can try and get done for around, but by quarter to 12, that would be really good. Um, just so that we can um, make our list and let everybody away sharp. Um, so I had a point, if that's okay, and it was around marketing, networking, getting the volunteers, but also um, drumming up interest in an event. Um, And I was really interested, Amy, what you said about these little places. (laughs) Because I live in one of these little places. And yeah, they the there's how can I put it there's a set of people in a small community and they are the ones that um always put on the events maybe they're connected to a community council maybe they're collect, connected to in, in 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 my local case it would be like the riding of the marches committee and they put all the events on and it's the same people every year and then after a couple of decades it's their children and the events are the same and they just continue so these are just three things that I wanted to share we like to treat the local great and the good and networks of people as influencers now I hate that word and I'm not talking about famous Instagram people but every community has an influencer whoever that might be in our community it's the provost, it's the minister, it's the local butcher, actually, you know, it's some of the teachers are really popular. So when, um, and I, I put, I'm lucky to say that I've put events on in every single town in Dumfries and Galloway over the last 30 years in my career. And it's the same in every single one of them. If you find the influencer, you find that person that people want to see, want to hear from. So that's one thing. And also, it's really good to expand that and actually have a core of people that you invite because they become influencers by saying, oh, we're going to such and such event. We've been invited to go to such and such an event. So if you're very strategic about who you invite, and while that might cost you a little bit of your budget, they bring people with them. And that was my final one. Include in your event in some way, when it's a small community, children, because they bring their families and their families buy tickets. That was was kind of just some of the things I wanted to share. Um, I don't mean young people, 
uh, th that's very different and I'm very passionate about um, giving young people their place and allowing them to be heard and create their own ideas and, and, and put their own events on. I'm talking about primary school kids. If you include them, they bring their mums and dads and uncles and aunties and grannies and grandpas every time and they all buy tickets and raffle tickets and etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're boosting your audience that way too um and i think that's great to... i think that's great advice i also think you know trying to unearth those people who really don't you know work out who it is that isn't coming and try and um find from out from them what it is that you might do there's a lot of silent voices in communities as well um so and maybe some of the influencers might know who they are and then you, you could get them in, involved as well one of the things i was hoping we could all have a discussion about and sorry i just want to flag up in case you hadn't noticed maggie has shared some really useful links the council does a toolkit for events and she shared that in the chat box so if you click on that then you can save that link um, clear. thank you <laughs> <laughs> um the what was i going to say yes mm, how do we all feel we're talking about fundraising and there are funders but there are other ways to raise, raise money. And so I wondered how you all felt. You mentioned it, Matt, as private sponsors. We've had, an, we've had a lot of success from private sponsors, even if it's an in-kind service from local businesses. So I wondered if any of you wanted to share experiences or thoughts on that. You, you as well, Matt, obviously. Go for it, Matt. Um, yeah, I mean, we um, when we did the the Chindi last year, um, one of the things we kind of we, we looked at was a, a a main sponsor for it. Um, and when we initially went round the local businesses, some were quite happy just to to drop fifty pounds into the pot just to be associated with it. Didn't really want anything in return for it. Just thank you very much for the community um on the basis also some of them will get more footfall in in particularly shops would get more footfall on the day um but we did have a, a couple of local businesses said that they would be quite interested in in doing a main sponsor package for it um and fortunately we kind of had put something together and said right well we're going to have a stage so you can be the stage sponsor and if you want to be the stage sponsor it's going to cost you 200 pounds um and we should have asked for more because they didn't blink an eye and they gave us the 200 pounds but what it's also led to is we're repeating the event this year um and they this year they're doing more of an in-kind because they're a construction company so they're looking at supporting us to actually create a mobile stage that we can use year in year out and can use at other events as well and they will sponsor that stage um knowing that it's going to get used at other community events around the region and will carry their their brand with it um we did have interestingly enough we did have somebody who uh gave us 50 pounds sponsorship and said yes can you put our name up um just to the to the side of the stage um and then on the actual day we had a falling out with them um because uh some people from the event were using their toilets and had left the toilets in a poor state of affair um so they announced largely on loudly on facebook that they would never support the event again and how dare these people come and use their toilets um so and when i went into the shop to to have a chat with them i the the, the words that were not expletives were on one hand um but uh unfortunately i hadn't cashed their check so i just said well here's your check back i'm sorry about that as i can't do anything about what people are doing but uh thank you very much we've made up in in the interim um and uh he he's given us 50 pounds again for this year so we'll see what happens but, um it, 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 yeah it's kind of in the terms of what you're getting for the sponsorship what he was not expecting was to have to clean his toilets up so um and you know 
what we've led for this year is we're going to be a lot clearer in terms of where the public toilets are and where people should be going to use the public toilets um as opposed to you know just nipping into the nearest establishment that has toilets i would cash the check Matt. <laughs> it, it gave me some kind of satisfaction that i had and i could you know just no, I, I, I would cash the one you now have quickly yeah in case that one bounces <laughs> i would say as well if you're getting sponsorship that's corporate from a business whether it's a small business to or 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 something bigger like they want to actually be a main sponsor before they even send you the money sit down and have a meeting with them and agree exactly what it is they're going to get in return so we did that uh i did that for for nithraid a number of years back and there were various levels of sponsors so some people just wanted their name on a banner other people wanted guests to be there and they were willing to be they wanted mentioned on an advert so tap into the businesses that would get the most out of that type of event and also get the most out of that type of sponsorship so maybe for example a local business in a local event isn't going to get anything out of giving an event 200 pounds to have their name on a banner because the banner is going to be in the town where the shop front is that's not going to help them but it might help them if they give you money to promote the event on the radio around the entire region because their business is being promoted around the entire region so think about what is best for the business and offer them that in return for the sponsorship. That 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 that's a carrot for them. I've, Anyone else? I've mentioned Arts and Business Scotland. Now that's uh, yes, that's a much bigger scheme. Um, I, no, I I apologies. I can't remember what the membership is, the cost of it. But I've been an individual member. I think it was forty pounds, but I might be wrong. <laughs> Uh, so that that tends to be that's for it it, um, it works with the, the government's scheme to, to encourage sponsorship within the arts and it does tend to be for bigger organizations and events I would say but uh, and for kind of every pound that a new sponsor someone new to sponsoring the arts it gives to a, a project or a, an organisation or event, then there, there's a ma match funding for that. But it's more than that arts and business. It also offers advice uh, on on various aspects of 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 you know working with business and sponsorship and events and also governance for organisations. And and these are all things that as as you know. This is a creative event and it's looking at community events, but as those grow and get bigger, then there are a lot of issues like that, like governance and, and as you said, safeguarding volunteers and employees eventually. So it, it, it might be worthwhile just checking it out. Um, it, I also found it very good for networking and whilst you know the organisation that I was with didn't secure new funding, there were loads of opportunities to meet with other organisations, with sponsors, and just, you know, get a chance to put your organisation out there. So it might be worth having having a quick check. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone's got any experience of collaborative events and not partnerships as such, but actual collaborations and either the pitfalls or the, the benefits to, to those such events within a community. Has anyone got anything they can share with that regard? Um, to me, a collaboration means that it's an equal partnership and um, in terms of who's paying for what as well as who's benefiting. Is, is, is that is that what you mean, Amy? I just wanted to double check. Yeah, yeah. I guess rather than having a kind of, you know, like a, having a, an, an organisation who are, organizing an event and developing partnerships you know engaging people to do things for them in the sense of partnership i mean a collaboration like you're describing you know um well we did one last year during lockdown not last year god can you believe it? it's two years ago in 2020 we did one um driftwood cinema did um an online season and they collaborated with us, the Media Factory, with Campbell Line, 
was real to real and the cat strand and so that was a true collaboration actually because all of us delivered that but what i would say which is the model that we used with driftwood and matt is that even in a collaboration there has to be a leader otherwise it just gets quite confused somebody needs to take ownership of it and say i'm in charge so this year we're resurrecting the southwest picture show and we're going to be in charge but we will be collaborating with driftwood and many other organizations to deliver that festival um okay so that's interesting thanks tabby uh, anyone else want to add to that for collaborations? I, I, thanks, Claire. But thanks, Claire. <laughs> See you soon. I'd just like to see that actually, even amongst you know, individuals and organisations that know one another, they really set out from the start, like what the parameters are, who's doing what, who that leader is. I mean, even amongst friends, it, it really is important that you get all that laid out before you start and, and probably just make sure you are regularly checking in and feeding in with one another and, and reviewing. Um, I think that's really, really important. I know actually from working in partnership with a colleague, not anything connected with where I am now or even past, but I've known that I, I didn't do that and it ended up quite sticky when problems arose so make sure there's a clear thing down there on on paper actually that you can follow and and, and check in if, if there are things that happen. so so transparency and communication yeah. really yeah yeah absolutely and and I think trust I think there's a thing about like Matt described that you know I put slightly apocryphal tale but it's it's really look at who you're working with first and make sure that your values and I think that word you know values that your creative and actually your professional values and personal values do align with the people that you're working with that that is important. All right. Oh, you're on you mute. Need to unmute. <laughs> All right. Been on mute so long I forgot. I know. <laughs> I thought otherwise you might think I wasn't able to speak. Um, on, you know, as far as collaborative events go, Ted and I, my other half who I work with, um, we just started a series of uh, land use conversation events. Um, it's sort of generated almost quite organically, really. We had an art exhibition at the Cat Strand and then, um, you know, thinking about events we could run alongside that that would also bring in you know, potential for community engagement and discussion around a very relevant topic um, and using kind of art as a springboard for that because people can get very bored with, you know, incessant consultation, can't they? Um, and so we did that one, Cat Strand were hosting the, the exhibition, but we kind of had the Cat Strand and GCAT organising the volunteer side of it, you know, in terms of hosting the event. And meanwhile, we went off and sourced all, you know, the panelists, um, you know, what everyone was going to do and took charge of all sort of that side of the organisation process. Uh, no one was making any money, so we didn't have to worry about that. You know, the cat stranded the hosting and the, and the refreshments. And then we, that's now evolving into another sort of online one where we'll collaborate with the Galloway Glens and then it will probably go back into another in-person event at the Cat Strand and bringing in a whole range of, of different partners on that. So mm -hmm. I was just sort of chipping that into the mix. That sounds great, Morag. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks. I think the thing about collaborations as well that is really important is that it helps you tap into a whole network that you might not have access to. So it improves your own network as an organization, but also all of our networks as individuals. And if you navigate the pitfalls, as Maggie quite rightly advised, to make sure what's agreed is written down, that you're constantly checking the milestones over a period of time and making sure everybody's happy and that there's clear communication channels. I actually think that 
in terms of any group that might not be feeling confident or not feel that it has the skills, collaboration with another organization is one of the best ways to give yourselves a boost and to give your event the biggest chance. Um, sorry, I'm... Sorry, sorry, I was distracted because I didn't put any money on my daughter's Scott card, so she's got to queue up for hours for her lunch now, so... <laughs> Has anyone else got any questions? I think it just in terms of the, the partnership and collaborator thing, I think the, the one you mentioned earlier, Tavi, was quite useful because we worked with um, Aidan at Catstrand um, and um, Campbell Line as well. Mm -hmm. And the way it worked with that, is, as you said, we had different skills that we kind of brought into to it that, that made what would have been um, a, you know, a one-off a series of, of, of screenings allowed us to kind of branch out further. So Cat Strand and um, Campbell Line had, had used uh, Eventive as our online platform, so had skills in terms of setting up the films, et cetera, that were on there. But then we were able to market, you know, to our to our audience, which was wider cinema, um, and yourself as well, Tabby, to, to kind of promote into your audiences as well. So that that was a you know good collaboration. I've had I have had collaborations where I'm not quite sure going into it whether I'm a supplier um, or, or working in true partnership or not. Um, and without having that transparency up front, it can limit what you're doing and what you expect you're going to be delivering. Um, particularly, again, it's kind of cinema is where I'm at, but it, in terms of the films that we could choose uh, were limited because we were seen more as a supplier than than actually a partner organization that was running the film side of things um you know but there were other advantages to us working in that partnership in terms of being able to branch out beyond that that collaboration elsewhere so i think it's with sponsorship with advertising with partnership getting everything clear up front on what you're getting and what you're giving up um is is important and if possible get it in writing with with the advertising having the package predefined um it, it makes it that much easier to to start off with you've got something in writing to start off with but um yeah beware with partnerships whether the people you're partnering with are seeing you as a supplier um rather than a true partner that's a really good point um and that's about building the network so I think just before I hand over to Maggie to finish off, um, does anyone have any final comments or questions? Are we quite happy? What I'm going to do is gather all the notes. I've been furiously taking notes all the way through and that I will add that and maybe spend a little bit of time doing some email um, table tennis with Matt and Maggie so that we can come up with a nice to-do list that we can then share with managers, uh, with members of DG Unlimited. And I will, we will share it with all of you. And if you would be kind enough to do a little survey to give us some feedback, that would be wonderful. Matt, thank you very much for being a great friend to us and to DG Unlimited. And over to Maggie, quickly. Um, just say officially thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, well, I have found this absolutely fascinating. And I know the point is not just that I find it fascinating, but I think from the discussion that's been generated, um, it, everyone else has to, and actually loads of great, great advice and input from, from, from everyone. So thank you all. Huge thanks to Matt. That was really fantastic. I, um, it, it, it reminded me of a lot of things from having my previous role as an executive director of a community-led project. But it also, there was lots of other new things from you, Matt, and from Tabby Clear and everyone else. Uh, so th thanks. That was phenomenal. And, and always thanks to Tabby, who is who keeps me right in many departments. <laughs> um, I, I would just like to see that this this so this next level um webinar is part of our creatives unlimited 
um, programme. It's the second year we've had this funded. Uh, huge thanks to Creative Scotland and to the Hollywood Trust. And I echo Matt and Tabby. Um, they are absolutely a fantastic funding organisation to, to, to work with, really inspirational. Um, I, I'm not going to go into huge detail about Creatives Unlimited. What I would suggest is if you look at our website, www.dgunlimited.com, and our Creatives Unlimited drop down menu, it will give more details about that. Um, I, I did mention our review of our strategic uh, plan. Please do input into that. If it's okay with you, can we email you and, and get um, some input from you? Um, that, that would be fantastic. I'm, I'm just going to check if I missed it. I don't think I've missed it. You check. And while you're checking, I just want to very briefly say that we've got a whole series of events in person and on Zoom coming up. So if you just keep an eye on our social media, that would be good. And tell your friends and your influencers. <laughs> and oh, just another thing, we, we've got a focus our new uh, online magazine. The first edition will be published soon, but we're also always looking for content for that too and to help pr promote. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much. Brilliant. For thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, Matt's gone as well. Yeah.